have to talk about the fact that a young, he wasn't even called Jimmy at the time, but this young, brilliant guitar god is living with the Isley Brothers around this time. We're talking about none other than Jimi Hendrix. The Jimi Hendrix. Jimmy, Jimmy with an I. Jimmy with one M and an I. J I M I. Hendrix with an X. Come on, let's go. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Right. I mean, this this is Jimi Hendrix, who is we we look at Ernie Isley who to me is criminally unsung as one, you know, and it, it, shout out to the other guitar gods, all, all of them from, from Santana to Garcia to all these cats. But Ernie Isley, who from the age of 11 is under the tutelage of the one and only inimitable, untouchable Jimi Hendrix. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And you know what? And to your point, Ernie played bass on It's Your Thing. And being under the tutelage of Jimi Hendrix allowed Ernie to literally move from the bass to the actual guitar. In the oh, that wasn't Marvin on It's Your Thing? No. Oh. No, Ernie was playing bass on those first two albums. When Ernie moved to the to, to lead guitar in rhythm and rhythm guitar <laughs> because let's talk about that and drums and, and drums right because when you think about jimmy that's what jimmy did jimmy was a trio he played rhythm guitar and lead guitar at the same time all right bom, bom, da, bom, bom, da. you know he played rhythm and lead at the same time and so ernie was able to do rhythm guitar and lead guitar you know for the osley brothers and he started out playing the bass and he and, and part of it may have been the fact that you had jimmy playing lead guitar and you're watching him and so for some of those albums ernie mainly played bass and then he started to move on to the lead guitar and i'm so glad that he did because ernie isley is literally when it comes to to r&b music ernie isley is my number one he's Come on. my, he's my goat he's my, when it comes to r&b music he is my goat. All right. So shout out. We love you, Ernie. We love you, Ron. You know, all we love you guys. Ernie Isley, thank you for your sound. Thank you for all that you did and continue to do in your music. Amen. And that would have made Ernie a teenager on It's Your Thing. Absolutely. We have to also shout out, of course, James Brown and Sly and the Family Stone, because I think that those are two other uh, entities that that surround the Isley Brothers when it comes to cultivating sound and feeding off each other. And yeah, yeah, come on now, come on, come on, come on with it now. Come on with it. <laughs> come on with it. Yeah. We, we, gonna, we gonna get back to that because when we get into the songs, there's a connection to, to Sly. And I just we're gonna think of the same song. I know it. I know we are. Yep. <laughs> from, from the first note. Yeah, from the first note. From the first... <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of talk about something very, very mysterious about that song. Okay. To Sly Stone. All right. Well, well, come on. Let's let's move on into the 70s then, because I can't wait. So we entered the 70s, fresh off of this huge hit, It's Your Thing. And they release an album per year leading up to 1973, which is the pivotal three plus three. And we'll get into why that's the name of the album. We have Getting Into Something that comes out in 1970, Giving It Back in 71, and Brother, Brother, Brother in 72. And we hear the Isleys like Marvin, like Stevie, and like Dylan and Carol King and these other people getting more socially conscious in their music. Brother, Brother, Brother features the song Ohio by Neil Young, and it's a mashup with Machine Gun by Hendrix. And of course, they're talking about Kent State. They're Carol King's Brother, Brother, Brother. They cover Dylan's Lay, Lady, Lay, which is not a social commentary per, per se, as far as I know. 
also Jackie DeShannon put a little love in your heart, but she also sang what the world needs now. There's something really interesting that I think we also need to talk about here that goes back to your original statement about the boxing in of black music. Yeah. And I think that these covers sort of culminate with Summer Breeze, which ends up on, on, their, on their 1973 album. But before that song, and we'll talk about it, they're covering a lot of soft rock, folk, yeah. leaning music, which I love. I love bread and seals and crops and Joni and I mean, all, all that stuff, it, it, Carol King. When conversations of the Isleys come up, there's always the conversation about hip hop, rightly so. There's always the conversation about their collaboration with a certain R&B artist that will not be mentioned on this show. Mm. But what we don't talk about enough, I think, about the Isleys is their folk and what we call rock, because because Lil Richard said rock and roll ain't nothing but uh, R and B sped up. Absolutely. Come on now. Yeah. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, as you said, we have to package things for for our understanding for people to know sort of exactly what we're honing in on here. Their rock oriented work and and particularly the folk stuff because we're going to get into the rock with this album, right? But like. What's that about, you think, where, where that that's sort of glossed over? Because that, to me, is a huge part of their legacy. You know, covering James Taylor and Carol King and Seals and Crofts and all, all these groups and making really beautiful music. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I want to throw in uh, Todd Rundgren's Hello, is me? Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> You know, Ron just took the first five minutes of the song just to say hello. You know, <laughs> take the first, you know, but, but I, I. That's he, he, probably my favorite one, but go ahead, go ahead. Oh, go come ahead. on, come on. I, yes, it is. I mean, for me too. Oh, Lord have mercy. Ooh, we, I, I got to listen to some Ozzy brothers after this, you know. I know. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it, it's, it's for me, it's the note when he goes, hello, hello, hello. That hello, yeah, oh, that, 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 that. yeah, 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 yeah. Where he starts it, and then he, you know, he's like a surfer. He's riding that chord, you know. Mm. Well, what I'll say is the people you that you named, you named, you know, Dylan, and you mentioned, you know, the Cow Kings, and you know, you mentioned quite a few people, you know, Brad Sills and Croft, James Taylor. When when talking to them, their heroes always come out of black music these artists here you know whether it be the folk artist bob dylan will sit down and bring you through the folk artists um, and musicians you know that were that came out of the blues tradition in you know folk music music of the folk music about folk you know and those were the people that they looked up to then you had jimmy in the band you know and you had various people you know, it was just this intersection. They came at a perfect time of an intersection of blues, folk, rock, R and B, soul. They were at it. They were around at a time where the uh, soul music wasn't a term. You know, for for a genre. You know what I'm saying? They were playing as a family and doing what they were doing before anybody heard the term rock and roll, you know? So this is cultural stuff that we're talking about. And I think that the Osley brothers, you know, they recognized in those artists, these artists are really good. And not only are these artists good, but they're doing something that also feels like home to, to us. You know what I'm saying? And that's why we love soft rock so much because we hear some soft rock and be like, mm, you know what I'm saying? And I think that they were doing that and they were free enough especially going out, stepping out on their own. It's our thing in doing the type of stuff that they just wanted to do. You know, they just yeah. said, you like that song. And then what they did was they put a level of syncopation with it. They put a level of soul and they put a level of these different elements. You know, they bring the bongos in and then they'd have the drummer do a thing. And then the bass line would be doing the set. Then the, the guitar rhythm, the licks and it, it, so what you had was something like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis talk about. Terry says, I'm the funk and Jimmy is the melody. So you're hearing Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis's music. You hear these beautiful melodies 
and then you hear like this, you know what I'm saying? So you put those two together and the Osley brothers were doing that. This is something that Gamble and Huff did. You know, also this is something that Motown did. Give you a backbeat that's just funky, but then give you just a beautiful melody riding on top of it. And I think the Osley brothers, they would hear these beautiful songs and they would say, you know what? Let's do something with this. Let's take it on home. You know what I'm saying? And that's what they did. <laughs> Let's take it on home. Take it on home. <laughs> I'm picking up what you're putting down with that one, too. I knew you would. You know, I would. And, <laughs> I, and I, I think this is a great time to talk about the great Chris Jasper. I mean, Woo! listen, man. I mean, his flowers are so overdue. It's not even funny. Chris Jasper, who grew up in the same neighborhood or even, I think, the same building as the Isley Brothers, his sister ends up marrying Rudy Isley, and now late Rudy Isley. And Chris Jasper goes to Juilliard because Billy Taylor is there, the great jazz icon and educator and musician, Billy Taylor. Chris is adding a certain sophistication harmonically to these folk songs. Chris is also, and DJ Spinner put me onto this, I didn't even realize that other than Stevie, Chris was really the next person to you utilize Tonto. That yes. synthesizer. Yes, yes, absolutely. When I was <clears throat> when I was kind of coming into my own as a producer, mm-hmm. one of the things that I said was, I want my music to sound like the Osley Brothers. And the reason why I said that was because they always fused kind of this organic, you know, <clears throat> Ernie Osley on a acoustic guitar, you know, Jasper on the uh, piano, but then they would layer it with some roads on top, floating, doing these beautiful chords and melodies and harmonics. And then Ernie would go pick up his electric and put something on top of that, you know? So there was this layer of just this kind of stripped down vibe, organic vibe with that tanto, that synthesized sound, that roads, that And those were the things that I feel they had in common with Stevie Wonder, because this is something that we'd hear him do as well. And then come to find out they had some of the same engineers in those same, you know, technological minds that they were working with. You know, those big, those, that that Tonto stuff looked like you were working like like in a cockpit somewhere, you know, flying a plane or something like that. (laughs) Exactly. The Tonto is just the, the, I I just want a blown up photo of that to frame and hang in my house because the way they were able to utilize it gave us the greatest music of the last hundred years. I mean, and shout out, we cannot, we would be remiss not to mention the names Malcolm Cecil and Robert Marguloff. Uh, Absolutely. They were very instrumental in, in, in building that rocket ship, that cockpit thing that enormous thing called tanto that we associate with stevie but also need to definitely associate with chris jasper in fact they recorded three plus three in la because of stevie wonder absolutely absolutely yeah. they were doing the album at around the same time he was doing intervision and and stuff like that and you know rumor has it that they were able to sit in on don't you worry about a thing while Stevie's recording that, you know, you know, so just, just all of these roads that kind of intersect. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, amazing stuff. So I think this is a great time for us to get into three plus three. This album, I believe is their sort of first foray into, well, not the first, but since leaving other major labels and then having t neck. Yeah, and then kind of return, I guess, return to the majors with with three plus three. And let's talk about why it's now called three plus three. 
Yeah. So just for the record, when they went back, they went back to the majors on their own terms. And that's the beauty of it. They went back, but they went back on their own terms. Three plus three. So whenever you go back and you look at, you know, you make me want to shout and even down to layaway, you know, with my guys, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, come on, like this right here. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. <laughs> you know, but when they went, you would see three of them. And the focus would be, the spotlight would be on three of them. That's the first three. But for some time, what you had was, you had the brothers really playing with them, backing them up, but the spotlight wasn't on them. And <clears throat> there became a moment where it was like, you know what, you know what, brothers? Come up here, come up here. You know, instead of being back there, come up here, you know, because we're, we're all one. And they kind of put it all together. Three, the three vocalists, plus three, the band, and we're going to put it all together. We are the Isley Brothers, because they are. That's you right. Know? Exactly. So we got O'Kelly, Rudy, mm -hmm. Marvin, Ernie. We got Chris Jasper. Uh, we got Marvin. Who did I forget? Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm forgetting somebody. <laughs> Why is this just an instrumental right now? This somebody's <laughs> listening, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the verses? These, these, these are karaoke tracks. Right, yeah. right, right. Exactly. Ron Isley. Yes, exactly. So we have now three plus three. And now, like you said, now we are the Isley brothers. As you said, they had already been working with them, but they're pushed to the forefront. And not only are they pushed to the forefront, but Ernie tells this great story about when they cover their own song, they cover who's that lady? And it becomes that lady. And Ernie's like, hmm, that's like a bossa, you know, cha-cha song that they put out in, I believe, 64, if I'm not mistaken, 63, 64. And Ron is like, yeah, but we gonna, we gonna do it. We gonna do it a little different this time. And you're gonna play lead guitar. You're gonna have a solo. And okay, so let's, I'm excited. Let me push it back a little bit. Pull back a little bit. <laughs> You're getting hyped. You're getting hyped. I'm, hi I'm getting hyped now. <laughs> because when that intro of that first track from 3 plus 3 comes on, this is their coming out party. This is, we are a band. We went from being a group. We are officially a, a band, you know. And that rhythm guitar starts. And then you hear that fuzz, that, that, that wail, that scream. It's I mean. It's a wrap. They, Ernie Isley came and kicked down the door. I mean, he didn't. He didn't come in quietly. Like he came in, and was like, "Oh, this is what y'all going? Y'all put me up front? Got you. Say less. All right." And I mean, and then you think about, like I said, his kinship and his friendship with Jimmy, and Jimmy using those pedals and stuff, and Ernie Isley. When you go back to the seventies, or as my as, as my family would say, the seventies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would look at his equipment, his pedals, and it would be so much he had there. I mean, it was like, this is for this. Remember, I'm gonna get you sucker, and he had all the things. He said, "This one is for typing. This one is for surfing. This one is for." I mean, Ernie Isley, his equipment was otherworldly. Ernie Isley would even hook his guitar up to a Leslie, like an organ Leslie, you know, and later on when you hear voice to Atlanta and he, and then it's like, it sounds like, and then, you, and then you hear the tremolo, he hits the tremolo and you hear the tremolo first and then he takes the tremolo off and then it goes straight. He's hooking his guitar up to a Leslie. So Ernie Isley was not only just his chops, but he was so innovative into the sounds that he was creating on these records. Uh, he was just one of one. And just coming in, who's that lady just kicking the door down like that? I mean, whose music sounded like that at that time? Nobody. Nobody. Not only that, to your point about it not sounding like anybody, he takes, what, a three minute or so solo and, and that's you know and that's when the eyes with the part one the part two it's like we we got to do it that way because we're going to incorporate solos 
in our music. And to that point, that was something that was more so reserved for jazz, more so reserved for, uh, I guess, electric rock, you know, rock that centered around the electric guitar and things like that. There were no solos, really, rock guitar solos like that in soul music. And what was interesting was that the label is saying, well, how do we market this? There's no horns. Mm -hmm. And there's this veiled racism, let's just call mm -hmm. it with me, because, you know, and it's nothing against horns. I love horns, but, you know, string instruments, whether we're talking about classical music or guitar in the 60s and 70s, this was all, and it, it's, it's ironic because you have people like Chuck Berry, but okay, and, and Bo Diddley and, and all these amazing people, but these these instruments were sort of looked to be reserved for why unless it's the bass you know y'all 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 can play that bass but yeah 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 <laughs> but the fact that they're like well how are we going to market this because there's no horns and there's this you know you know rock guitar it's like you're going to market it like as it should be marketed you know so there's so that that's really interesting too like you said kicking in that door sonically because we are kicked in the chest <laughs> with this song but also mm. kicking in the door to allow us to take up space in that arena that we are the forefathers of anyway it's like this weird like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 oh my gosh yeah and, and it showed how much they believed in you know, the band, how much they believed in the brothers, you know, they marveled at the genius of their brothers, you know, up here doing what they're doing, you know, and Chris Jasper, they would, no, do that, no, do that right there, go ahead, do that, you know what I'm saying, and they made room, they constantly made room for everybody, made room for the backgrounds, made room for the solo voice, made room for the solo guitar, made room for the, for the keys, made room for the drum, made room for everything, you know, even like, Years later, you know, footsteps, you know, you just, you're just going to start with the drum. You know what I'm saying? They always featured, you know, everybody. Everybody got some type of a feature. And, and I just wanted to say also, this album, 3 Plus 3, is released in August 1973, which, you know, we're, you know, celebrating, you know, as a hip hop 50, August 73, you know, and it just kind of brings it right back to their being right there, you know, when all of this stuff was happening. And just right quick, I mentioned Herb Rooney with It's Your Thing. Herb Rooney had also done a song with them called Get Into Something, you know, and Get Into Something was a, there's a, there's a break, there's a drum break and Get Into Something where Ron is kind of like, almost like James Brown, he's basically saying like, give the drummer some and he's kind of, and the drummer starts playing. That is an early break beat for all of the DJs that ultimately became hip hop. They would dance to that one break, get into something that was Herb Rooney again. But these guys, I'm just saying that the Osley brothers, their name in their music was right smack dab in the middle of hip hop, in the birth of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so who they are doing this album. And I guarantee you that everybody that was at Cool Herc's party loved the Isley brothers. Exactly. Right. Here and we are with the album. Amazing. And love this album in particular. And I think that's the thing too, is that they didn't lose their black audience because they were playing electric guitar and adding all of these elements to it. Like we were here for all of that shit. Like we were, we were lockstep, whatever y'all are doing, we are riding for y'all. I think maybe what the label was thinking is that it would somehow maybe isolate their their black fan base or something like that but that's not at all what happened you know quite the contrary you know in fact yeah. what track you want to get into next cuz we 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 can move around you know however you want to do this thing oh okay uh, move around uh, okay that I, I was like are we going to go in order are we just going to move around i was thinking the same thing and then i'm like you know what let's just what you want to do next okay so you know what let me let me see Let's get into let's get into something. Let's let's get into <laughs> you I'm know excited. what I'm excited. I'm excited. I will see what you're gonna say. Let's get into what it comes down to. Ooh, okay. Because I go. think I think we have a similar 
I think we have a similar <laughs> idea as to let me ask you, Angelica Beer, <laughs> when you heard that intro, what what jumped out at you? Oh man, slide the family stone right away. But here's something interesting and that I love and that I feel like is missing from music today. We don't see our peers celebrating our peers in real time, mm. you know? And that's one of the things that I love about this song because it is so clearly a nod to Sly and the Family Stone. You know, Fresh comes out the same year, comes out in 1973 as well. But Sly and the Family Stone, and I'm so glad that this book is finally coming out about Sly Stone, because these are also some flowers that I think are delayed. And like I said, between James Brown and Sly, I think those were big influences on the, the Isley Brothers, for sure. And when you hear what it comes down to, it's like, oh man, this is clearly rhythmically the sound, what is it called? The King, what's what's the, that, that drum machine that Sly used? The Lindrum. The Lindrum. Lindrum, yeah. I mean, you hear, you it's just oozing Sly and the Family Stone. And like I said, what I appreciate is the real time wink nods to the peers who were inspiring them in the moment. You really, really hear that. What do you hear? You know, when I hear that, Here's the interesting thing about that. So Sly, there was a there was a period of time where there's a conspiracy going around. And there was a time where Sly Stone, you know, they say that he was recording under assumed names, aliases, you know, maybe something about taxes, you know, or something like that. Well, one of the names that he is said to have uh, gone under is... Truman Thomas. And this is just a, this is, this is a, this is an urban, this is an urban legend. You know, you've heard from some insiders, some outsiders, but there was some aliases that he went by and there was some people that say he went by the name Truman Thomas. What makes it kind of hairy is there was a real guy named Truman Thomas who actually played organ. Now, Truman Thomas is credited as having played also on that, this particular song. Truman Thomas is said to have played on this record. So there is this thought, there's this thought that Sly was playing with other people. However, he was avoiding IRS and he had these assumed names. And so this organ that's on the Osley Brothers song is credited to have been Truman Thomas. And the interesting thing is, again, there is a Truman Thomas in the Truman Thomas that really existed worked with Sly also, all right? So it's just this crazy mystical kind of, because when you listen to the beginning of the song, what it, what it comes out to, it literally sounds like you're about to go into a Sly and the Family Stone song because of the organ in the wah-wah pedal, which was something that Sly was doing. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. So ultimately, it is a little mystery there. There's a little mystery there. I would love to have a conversation with some of the people who may have uh, been involved, you know, to kind of clear that up. But yeah, that's what I wanted to kind of throw in there. That's just a little something, a little misdirection for the listeners when you listen to it and say, hmm, it could be, it could be, you know? Wow. That's amazing. That makes, that would, that would make it make even more sense. I oh my. That's that's deep. Wow. 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 Mm -hmm. One of my favorite songs on this album is The Highways of My Life. The I knew it. I knew it. Heard you. You listen, heard you before you said it. You heard it before I said it? I heard it before I heard you before you said it because that's, listening to that song, you know. Shout what out song? to Monk, by the way. Shout out to Monk. That's me and T.L. Cross's wink nod to Monk every time we say it. So shout out to Monk. Heard it before you said Heard it. Heard you before you said it. Your great uncle, you know. And, you know, the thing is, I we never talked about this song. But every time I heard the song, I always knew that you liked this song. And somehow or another, we never talked about it. But I always heard this song and said, I bet you Angelica likes this song. But somehow or another, we never came to talk about it until now. Right this minute. It is a beautiful song with 
a, a, a beautiful arrangement. The tanto is very present there. You know, the beautiful piano, the lyrics of it, the, 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 the sentiment that it talks about. It is just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. Such a beautiful song. Uh, Chris Jasper talked about, because this song was written by Chris Jasper. He talks about something called the deceptive cadence. Okay. And I love this term because what he's basically saying is that there's a, a buildup that your brain will start to think the song is going one place because there's a pressure cooker of changes, a sequence that sounds like it's going to go somewhere else, go somewhere. And then it goes somewhere completely different. And then there's this release, there's this tension and release, there's the deceptive cadence. So I hear that very clearly on this song, the verse builds and builds and builds in one direction. And then the chorus is this huge release. There's this, there's, you don't hear it going there. And mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know. It's just like the heaven's gates opening up on that section. Mm. Oh my God. You know, you said that perfectly. You, you said what I feel and just listening to that, you know, and I'll tell you one thing, it was sampled a lot too in hip hop, you know, really? uh, Various people sampled that as well. It was sampled as early as Black Sheep, you know, in the 90s, you know, in the early 90s, you know. Oh. Yeah, it was sampled quite a few times. But it was also sampled by uh, an R&B group. And it, was, it wasn't it was sampled. It was replayed and interpolated by this R&B group. And the group was called La Day. And the song, they had a song called Baby I. And interestingly enough, that hits very close to home for me. We wonder because... why. We wonder why. There may be a lead singer. Some, somebody had to, somebody, somebody somebody sung lead for the group. You know, I was the I was the lead singer for La Day. Um, Shout out to La Day, who was a flagship group with the resurgence of the modern day Motown label of the 1990s. That's, you know, you deserve some serious flowers as well, my brother. So let, but let's go. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. So this is certainly one of my, one of my all time favorite Osley Brothers songs. And it also kind of, I think foreshadows what was going to happen with the Osley Brothers in the future with their ballads and with the beauty of where they went with it, you know, because Ron had spent so many years as, you know, this soul singer, this person that would kind of lean into some of the grit, you know, of the singing. And, and we don't give Ron Osley enough credit as a singer, you know, because he had everything. I mean, he, he has everything. I mean, from that well of gospel to that funk, but then he'd come back and give you that falsetto, just like as beautiful as any falsetto singer, could do and then he had the sensuality you know that smooth thing that he had to like like water just flowing like water yeah there, there, there. yeah there. <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect and this is this is one of those songs that kind of goes to show you what would happen for many many years just with the voice of ron isley you man know? the phrasing the voice the want for nothing, the, the effortlessness, the seeming, because it takes tremendous effort, but for our ear, just the the effortlessness of where he could pull from, the expressiveness of the way he spoke, the instrument itself, you know, just the un... Ooh, the patience. Speaking of the patience, I, I want to segue into Summer Breeze because part of what made the Isley Brothers covers of a lot of these soft rock and folk songs so interesting was how they pulled the tempo back. I mean, you know, and, and I love Seals and Croft, you know, it's here, you know, it's here, it's, it feels great. But I mean, just the patience, first of all, just that, like they already let you know like listen man listen man listen man have a seat have a seat 
sit back and relax. They primed us for that with doing Carol King's It's Too Late, their 10 minute version of that, where it's just like, you might as well just go on and have a seat. Take your time. Take your time with it now. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was something, I think about a song speaking of, you know, that album that I just put up, The Heat Is On, Sensuality, like you mentioned the word. I mm -hmm. mean, everything was just about, let's pull this back. And I think in the pulling back the tempo, they were able to really highlight the beauty of the song. It's almost like those slower takes of trains, giant steps. I love it at, at, at the, tr you know, locomotive speed, but it's something about like alternate take eight yeah. where yeah. you really can hear the gorgeousness of those changes. And I think the Isley brothers did such a good job of that and a lot of it had to do simply before we even get into the arrangement which i'd love for you to talk about the tempo listen listen the isley brothers to me are the fathers of slowing down the tempo and having a certain level of a groove and i also want to give a shout out to Isaac Hayes, you know, who had done that, you know, before, who had done that, just the slow groove. I mean, when you get into, let's say the, the earlier part of the seventies and we listen to, you know, Betty Wright, you know, bump, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like we are not in a, miss the big stuff. We're not in a rush with groove me. You know what I'm saying? We're not in a rush. We going to get there. You know what I'm saying? The Osley brothers were masters at that. Masters at that. Because, because in theory, we talked about it's your thing before. In theory, it's your thing should be faster. In theory, it's your thing to, to, to do what you want to do. In theory, but they said, nah, bump, 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 bump. That's where they were at with it. And I mean, so they had this thing where they're going to bring more to it by pulling it down and slowing it down to something more deliberate, mm. something just more specific. And we're going to literally get into the details of this. And you have to have an insight and a wisdom about the piece, about the song to slow it down. We ain't going to rush through this. We're going to slow it down and hit all the points. That's what this does. Oof. Yeah. That's it right there. That is a big part of the genius of their covers in particular, but also their original material, which is, you know, I mean, just as writers, composers, we haven't even gotten into that yet. I mean, I feel like this could be a three-part episode. I wish we had time to just talk about all the facets yeah, of, yeah, 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 yeah. of the Isley Brothers. I mean, Summer Breeze, just the the instrumentation the production and arrangement the way they flip that little melody piece and make put that in the front yeah as the yeah. Doo, 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 doo. i mean come on it, it it it's an announcement when you hear that part it is an announcement it is an event is about to take place this is an event you know what i'm saying yes yes that is just beautiful. The way you hit the nail on the head. I love how they did that. Yes. And Ron quoting the name of the tune because, you know, we don't, the Seals and Crofts doesn't get to saying Summer Breeze until the hook. And Ron is like, he's wailing that. He's like, Summer Breeze all in my mind. Like just wailing oh, on that. Come on now. From the top. From, from the, the top. top. You know, in It's a Bluesy thing that he did right there at the top you know what i'm saying it is a it why make why make him wait why make him wait for that you know what Ooh. i'm saying why make him wait you know we're gonna just we're gonna lay it right out here from the yeah. very beginning oh my god oh master. i love that that dichot that dichotomy of we're gonna make you wait in terms of the pulse and the tempo but we're not gonna oh that come on now i see yeah. what you're doing there i see you what you're doing there, there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, but but that that's the that is the genius of the Isley brothers. They're one of those musical forces 
where they created a language. Yes. They're the Osley Brothers language. Yes. It is through the music, it's through the arrangement, it's through the lyrics that they wrote when they wrote their original stuff. It's through the harmony, it's through the lead. There's a language that they created. And tempo has a lot to do with it because, you know, just if we go uh, much later and we think about In Between the Sheets, In Between the Sheets is another song that could have been faster. It could have been, you know, dun, 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 dun. but nah, they boom, 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 <laughs> like, listen, listen, but you know not what? Not only though, that. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm not going to forget. Go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. 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 So what I was going to say was that speaks to a time that speaks to culture. It speaks to culture. This is before uh, a microwave was in everybody's house. You know, mm -hmm. you know, speaking about, you know, Summer Breeze and some of those early, the issue thing. This is before, uh, you know, in every household, there's a microwave. This is before in every uh, uh, life, there was a computer in every house. Just the press of a button. You know, it was the process. You got to wait. You got to wait. Good things are worth waiting for. And that concept was still in the forefront of society. You got to wait for good things. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, you got to get, you know, you know you got to wait for good things. And so when he said summer breeze and they go, bah, 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 it's like, wait a minute. Did they remake summer breeze? Is that what I'm hearing right now? What are they going to, what are they doing? You know what I'm saying? What <laughs> like, what are they doing? <laughs> what are they doing? Little honeymooners wink nod right there. Go ahead, brother. Shout out to Jackie Gleason. You know? Shout out to Jackie Gleason. But, yeah. but, but I, I was just going to add to that. When you brought up between the sheets, and I, I know that's not what we talk about. No, no, come, come on now, come on, come on. I'm with <laughs> you. You with me? Is that vamp? That's another exercise in patience, and we're not going anywhere. We right here for I don't know how many minutes. That vamp, that doom, 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 boom, 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 boom. Hey. <laughs> I mean, we're just gonna sit right here. Right here. You know, that that's another example of how that concept that you're talking about, that good things come to those who wait, that pacing, that pulling that back, it evolved in their sound down into the, you know, the 80s. And and you brought up Biggie and Big Papa. To your point, that was also not common in hip hop, you know. Hip hop, we 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 was we was you know, you know we we you know we, we was jumping all over the place. Hey hey, you know we were we were doing the most dance wise. <laughs> come on now, come on now. So it's funny that you can't see our feet. So it just looks like we're doing the funky chicken. But <laughs> it was all about in the nineties. It was all about the footwork. It was all about that footwork. You know what I'm saying? And that was what made Big Papa so. Like what? Like you're gonna and and, and also the barges stay with stay with me, where it was like rapping over these these ballads. So to your point about the Isleys being hip hop before hip hop, that slow thing. Not only was it, you know, that was a pioneering sound for soul R and B music. It also allowed hip hop to have this this really revolutionary sound too in that in that song yeah yeah absolutely i agree a thousand percent yeah yeah so i think we have time to do one more we have okay one more so what what tune what tune would you like to dive into a little bit next you know what let's do okay we did some brief let's do something up tempo then yeah okay Let's do let, let's do you walk your way. Mm, okay. Let's do you walk your way. I like yeah. that. Oh man, you walk your way. Osley Brothers, man, this 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 cut on the album. I'm gonna tell you what I love about this song. And it almost kind of, you know, kind of embodies their journey for me. When I listen to them, what I'm hearing is. I'm hearing that Hammond organ. I'm hearing gospel when I hear that. But I'm also hearing 
that slow Osley Brothers groove that we've been talking about because it also has that funky element to it. it. It's beautiful because it has a beautiful song, you know, on top of it melodically. But then there's also this nod back to their Motown days because if you listen to their background vocals, there's a lot of interaction, you know, that kind of, you say a thing and then they repeat it, you know, in a unison, you know, then they come back and then they do the harmony behind it. You know, there was a lot of that going on and they approached this almost like the quintessential R&B soul group at the time. Mm -hmm. And you don't always hear the Osley brothers do that, but they, that never left their bag, you know, never left mm -hmm. it. And this was a moment where I was able to hear that. Then I also wanted to just point out the concept of love, because no matter what the concept was in the song, y'all could be breaking up, you know, you know, you walk your way, you know, but the level of respect, though, just the level of respect that they had towards this woman that they wrote about and that they were singing about just the level of love and respect. It wasn't like, you know, let the, let the doorknob hit you with, you know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't like that. <laughs> right, it right. was like, I care about this woman. I care about her. You know, things might not work out, but at the end of the day, there's just this level of love and respect mm -hmm. all throughout the Osley brothers music. Even when, we talked about between the sheets, you know, sharing our what love between the sheets. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, I, Ron Ivey said, "Listen here, <laughs> enough of this singing. <laughs> Let's <Yes>. make love." <laughs> <laughs> because the reality of it is, is it just wasn't carnal. It was not just carnal. There was some level of there was a connection, mm -hmm. love, and respect. And when I listen to this song and this album, who's that lady? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You know, when I listen to all of this stuff, what I'm hearing is some brothers that love their mom, you know, and who love their the women in their lives and the women in the community. And then the women <clears throat> that come into their lives. Th these are the types of men I'll never forget. <clears throat> I was shout out to my to my children, you know, my son and my daughter. Yes, indeed. I, yes, yes. When my I was niece about, and nephew. Your niece and nephew, Angeli. But when my daughter was about to be born, my cousin, who had nothing but girls at the time, because he kept going and now he got a couple <laughs> boys. Actually, <laughs> but he he said, you know what? He said, you know what? He said, you deserve a girl. He said, not everybody deserves a girl. Oh, wow. You deserve a girl. And when I hear these Osley Brothers songs, I say, you know what? They deserve a girl. They deserve to be girl dads, you know, yeah. because of the level of love and the level of respect um, through the lyrical content of their music. And that's what I love, you know, about this song. Oh, wow. That's really, really beautiful. I love that. That's, that's, that's so beautiful. And to your point, they brought the, because I mean, no one can argue that they're probably the, the most sensual group of all time. I mean, Absolutely. They, they, you know, I mean, you know, of course, Luther would come later as a solo artist and be, you know, the single handed baby, baby machine. Right. <laughs> but, but before, <laughs> before Luther Ronzoni Vandross. Ronzoni. Was, come on now. Shout uh -huh. out to the Bronx. Yeah. Shout um, out to the BX. <laughs> there was the Isley Brothers. I mean, nothing puts you in the mood more. But to your point, you don't have to sacrifice love and respect for the sensual. And I think that's something we, in our times, and there's a reason why the Isley brothers are still to this moment, you know, th their, their audience is expanding and it in the younger direction more and more every day. Right. And so there's something to be said as 
rap sales of current artists are down 40 percent meanwhile our generation is selling out tours just of course on, yes on the table but that's you know, a whole that's a whole episode that's a whole episode so to your point there is something that will never go out of style about love and respect and I just want to say, speaking of that organ, it brings Billy, Billy Preston to mind for me. That that sounds like like that that's right out the Billy Preston playbook. There, shout out to Billy Preston. Shout out to the great, great Billy Preston who crossed paths with Sly Stone. They had an album together early on. People don't even before you know all of this happened. And Billy Preston also crossed paths with. Jimi Hendrix you know they both played with Little Richard and you know that kind of thing I mean so yeah there's just there's just this community of just ideas and melody and love and everything kind of flowing through it and you could just hear it in the music itself absolutely I I think that's a beautiful way to close this episode on love especially Speaking of what the world needs now, I mean, we really need some love right about now. And so I think that's a beautiful way to close this episode. T.L. Cross, it is never anything short of an honor to sit and just hear the musings of your brilliant mind. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd love for you to, you know, tell people what you have coming up and where they can follow you because I want everybody. And I think I don't even need to prompt anybody to follow you. I think you've made quite a few <laughs> fans, but tell everybody where they can find you. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. You know, and just for full disclosure, y'all, we literally do this exact same thing on the phone without any cameras and nothing recording our, you know, our voices. And I'm going to tell y'all, we've been doing this since we were teenagers. All right. We've been doing this since we were teenagers. And we wish, this is like us finally recording our conversations that we've had. We've had, we've had, we've lost out on a lot of money probably with the conversations we had. We didn't, we, we solved problems of the world. We broke down entire groups and albums and, Oh my gosh. So it it's a pleasure to be able to do this with computers here, cameras and the audio and not only people being able to hear it and see it, but we can preserve it, you know, for ourselves. But so thank you again, TL Cross, where you can find me in a few places. One, there is, this is TL Cross. And that is my Instagram. This is TL Cross. And right now that's my hub. I'm working on my website, which would be an even better hub to bring everything together. But you can find what I'm doing there. You can tune into Bounce TV, you know, where you can find me, you know, you know, in between episodes and, and commercial breaks, breaking down the history of what you just saw, you know, uh, maybe whether it be hip hop, whether it be uh, movies or HBCU life, which is coming up. There's a big year for HBCU in 2024. And I'll be a part of that. That's exciting. Oh, it is. It is. You know, shout out to my mom and dad who went to Dillard University and Southern University, HBCUs. Come on. Oh, absolutely. And I'll say Cross Academy of Performing Arts. So there's a there's a school and program that I, you know, started just about five years ago. We're going on five years. And right now I'm in the Bronx. Shout out to the Bronx, as you said, in Harlem. And then we're in New Jersey, you know, shout out to the Osley brothers, you know, we're in Plainfield where, you know, George Clinton and those guys, you know, uh, you know, came from. Yeah, absolutely. So we're there and we're a performing arts program. We are also online. And again, this is T.L. Cross. Contact me. And last but not least, I'm the minister of music at a church, St. Albans a Congregational Church. Shout out to St. Albans Congregational Church. Yes. And my brother who is the pastor and we brought the the magnificent amazing angelica beaner in as they were doing this thing called jazz vespers that they've been doing for so many years and you you hosted it and i was i was out of town but i was i, I heard it was just magnificent i know what you do <laughs> i know how you brother do. thank you brother i i would love to come back anytime 
you and Reverend Wilson will have me back, say the word. Say less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So is that, uh, are those all the places we can find you that about covers it? Yeah, I want to say that co that covers it for now. There's a couple of documentaries that I'm working on and I'm a part of, and I'll have more information about it as I'm told to give out the information, mm -hmm. but I'm excited about it though. I'm excited too. I'm really excited, especially because you ain't told me about this yet. So, <laughs> so I got this, it. But when this recording ends, you're going to have some things to fill me in on. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody, T.L. Cross, thank you so much for being here. And we will, as always, see you next time. Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. Oh, that was dope. That, that was, was dope.